you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. Every time I've preached this message uh, to you, I've shared it in a prophetic vision of things that took place with the reign of Hitler and the Holocaust of the Jews. Uh, I've always used that. And uh, I've been reading, I read a lot, I read prophecy a lot, study prophecy a lot, but I don't want to speak prophetically. I want to speak here and now today. And uh, there's some great things in Ezekiel chapter 37 that uh, I want to share with you, verses 1 through 3. But before I do, let me read you a little something here. It says, for those of you who watch what you eat, here's the final word on nutrition. It's a relief to know the truth after all those conflicting studies. Number one, the Japanese eat very little fat, suffer fewer heart attacks than the English. Number two, the Mexicans eat a lot of fat, and suffer few heart attacks than the English. Number three, the Chinese drink very little red wine and suffer fewer heart attacks than the English. Number four, the Italians drink a lot of red wine, suffer fewer heart attacks than the English. Number five, the Germans drink a lot of beer, eat a lot of sausages, eat a lot of fat, and suffer fewer heart attacks than the English. Conclusion. Eat and drink what you like. Speaking English is apparently what kills you. <laughs> what was that? So we need to have some French lessons around here, don't we? <laughs> Spanish or... <clears throat> okay, count to three. Nobody laugh and let's get serious here. One, two, three. Everybody laugh. <clears throat> Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 3. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. I'll preach a message to you this morning entitled, When God Steps In. I mean, ready for God to step in. Well, I just felt the Holy Ghost. When God steps in, pray with me, please. Father, we pray that you'll step in today. We pray that the fiery anointing of the Holy Ghost will shake everybody in this house. I pray that your spirit and your holy angels are just swarm in this place today that we'll leave here. God just absolutely filled with your anointing. Thank you for what you're about to do in this church. We know that something is evidently about to happen because even though Satan doesn't know what you're up to, he's attacking in every direction, trying to find the one that's going to receive the blessing. But God, we know that you're going to pour an equal portion out upon all of us because we have walked by faith and we've held on to your word and you're not a man that you should lie but you're God Almighty. And I pray that the fire that was shut up in Jeremiah's bones will be shut up in ours, that we will absolutely enjoy the fiery presence of you today in this service. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I believe that God is still able to do the impossible. In fact, I believe that God wants to do the impossible. I still believe that in the midst of hopelessness in our lives, I still believe that that's the very time that God is wanting to step into our lives. In fact, God, or Jesus, spoke over Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you together as a hen with her brood, but you wouldn't let me. I wanted to do great things in your life, 
but you simply wouldn't allow it. I want to ask you this morning, if God wanted to, and I assure you he does, if he wanted to touch you today, if he wanted to move in every one of your lives, would you allow him to do so right now? It's not impossible for God, but God will not go against your will. All God needs is a yielded vessel. And as soon as Elisha came across Jordan after Elijah was caught up into heaven and he had the mantle of God upon him and he was challenged by a situation in Jericho, the waters were barren, Elisha knew exactly what to do. He says, give me a bowl. Give me a brand new vessel. The vessel represents you and me. He says, and pour it full of salt. The salt represents the word of the living God. That is to say, when we speak the living word of God out of our mouth, you can go to the source of the problem and you can speak prophetically over it. And the Bible said, And Elisha took the bowl of salt and he went to the head of the spring water and he poured it in and he said, Let there be no more death in this water. And the Bible said, And it is healed unto this day. Jesus said the things that are impossible with man are possible with God. Again, I'm going to tell you, I believe that God can still step in. When God decides it's time and he's ready, the whole situation has to change when he shows up. Oh, you always know when Jesus comes in the room, don't you? You always know when you start praying and you fight, you, you're struggling because you're just so sick and tired and you've struggled and you're, you're hurting and you're confused and you're just basically bearing your soul before God and you can't feel him. But oh, and you keep on praying until something erupts on the inside of you and when that eruption takes place, you feel the old go out and you feel Jesus coming in. Anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? Even when you're surrounded and you're up against utter hopelessness, if God is present, if I say if God is present, nothing is hopeless. If God is present, if you walk into a situation that's absolutely causing more turmoil than you know what to do with, as long as you've got Jesus, as long as you still have faith in your heart, as long as you're standing on the infallible word of God, if you've got Jesus, you'll always, I love my shot time, have enough. It may seem like you can't make it. But if God is present, I love the scripture, if God be for us. If God is on my side, Satan doesn't have a chance. Now, I will tell you something, as a believer, as a child of God sitting on your pew this morning, in the chair this morning, if you're a child of God, you either believe that God is real or you don't believe he's real. Either you'll call on his name the moment trouble shows up or you'll try to figure it out yourself. Amen? Oh, I'd like to turn it all over to Jesus. Well, how do you know I can? Because Peter said, casting all our cares upon him because he cares for us. When Ezekiel wrote this vision down in Ezekiel chapter 37, God's people were living in failure. And it's easy to understand why. They had rebelled. They had backslidden. They had erected idol groves and worshipped idol gods. God called it whoring after other gods, chasing after idols, not trusting him, not serving him, not lifting up his name, not, not worshipping him. And they had come to a place in their life where they had settled to just live in failure. This is my plot in life. This is the hand that life has dealt with me. I'm cursed because my daddy's cursed. I'm this way because my father was this way. I'm this way because, you know, I got lied on. 
I'm this way because someone else got all the, got all the credit for something I did. I'm this way because I've never gotten anything but bad breaks. Come on, folks. Their attitude was, we're just dry bones. We are alive, but we're dead. We're walking dead people. Our hope is gone. Our future has decayed. There's nothing to look forward to. Nobody will come to our rescue. It's as if everybody else owes them something. Can I remind you this morning that the world is not your source? Can I remind you that that company you work for is not your source? Can I remind you that your mama and daddy, they may have raised you, but they aren't your source? I want you to know that God is your source. And the Bible said in Hebrews, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. That simply means he was with you when it all began, and he'll be with you through it all and in it all. And when it's all said and done, he'll still be, he'll still be the Lord of your life. Give him a clap offering of praise if you believe it. They were saying we're still here, but we have no future. And all along, God was saying, I know the things that I, thoughts that I think toward you, that you have a future and that you have an end. What you do with your future is up to you. Your time is now. Your future is now. Yesterday is in the tomb of time. Tomorrow is in the womb of time. Only the now is what we have and what we can hold on to. Amen, somebody. They thought that because they had turned their back on God, they thought because they had betrayed God, they thought that they had taken up idolatry and worship him, they thought because of all of that, God had forsaken them and God was no longer interested in their lives. I've met a few people along the ministry a lot of them who were so sunk deep in sin that their lives were degradating with just a state of pitifulness, really. And you go up to them and you try to talk to them about hope. You try to talk to them about getting a hold of life and fulfilling your mission, your purpose in life. You ask them, Can, do you want to be saved? And they'll tell you, I can't be saved. God doesn't love me. I've been too bad. I failed him too many times. I've gotten in and gotten out so many times. I, I lost count a long time ago. God doesn't care about me. I don't care if you're saved or not. When it comes to this one statement, none of us in this room will ever be able to comprehend or understand the mercy, the compassion, and the long-suffering that God has for each and every one of us. Or oh, if it wasn't for his mercy. Where would we be today if it wasn't for the mercy of God? And how many times have you read in the four Gospels about Jesus where it says, and he was moved with compassion? That means he's overzealous for you. He sees those who are prospering and he's jealous for you to have what others are having, but yet it seemed like prosperity and healing and blessing has passed you by. God doesn't intend for it to be that way. Jesus wants you to be in good health and prosper in all things, even as his soul prospers. God looked on the captivity of Israel he watched them fall into idolatry. He was with them and trying to be their God when they chose to become unfaithful as he has with us. Amen. You would have thought that a God of any kind who had any kind of rules and regulations, you would have thought that after all that Israel had done, and all the times they had forsaken God and spoke against him, you would have thought that God would have brought swift judgment upon them, but instead, he chose to reach out 
he could have just started over as he did with Noah and his family. By the time the flood relented, there were only eight people on this planet. God had to start all over again because the thoughts of man's mind was only evil continue. God repented that he even made man. I don't want God to ever be sorry for the day I was born. I don't want God to ever be sorry that he trusted me with so much and I ended up being unfaithful to him. I don't want God to ever regret that he gave me so much love and I would not extend it to someone else who had a greater need than myself. Hello. And I'll show you great things and mighty things that you're not aware of. He hasn't abandoned us. He's reaching out to us. We used to sing the song. And every time we'd sing it, people would get to crying and squalling and walking the aisles. Reach out and touch the Lord as he goes by. You'll find he's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. He's passing by this moment your needs he'll supply. Just reach out and touch the Lord as he goes by. When they said, we're alive, but we're dead. God took Ezekiel out into a valley of dry bones and he literally showed him what hopelessness looks like. God showed him nothing but bones. Everybody say bones. He showed them or he showed him what hopelessness actually looks like. The bones represented a state of no hope at all. But God said, watch what I can do with dry bones. You think that there's nothing left sometimes. Sometimes we act like the disciples, we measure what needs to be done against what we've got left. Jesus said to his disciples, see if you can find some food. And the Bible said, but he already knew. He already knew. I'm telling you this morning, God already knows what he's going to do in your life. He already knew what he was going to do. He come back and said, we found a kid here, five loaves and two fish. But what is that among so many? In other words, what difference does it make? Well, God was about to show them. I want to tell you something prophetically. God's about to show some of you what happens when he shows up, and he shows up because of your faithfulness. He shows up because your unrelenting commitment to him. There's not a devil in hell that can defeat one believer if we'll keep our minds set on God. God moved Ezekiel around the entire valley. I want you to see this. I've never seen this before until this week. Showed him every area where there were dry bones, which represented the entire nation of Israel. You see, he was showing them that because they were speaking this into their life, they were snared by the words that they had spoken. They were trapped. But the sad thing is, it was as if nobody cared. A horrific battle had taken place of some sort. Moans just scattered all over Israel. Whatever had happened, whatever holocaust, whatever tragedy, whatever taken place, they were just left there. Nobody took the time to bury them and give them a profit, decent home going. Nobody seemed to care. This is the situation. At that moment, Israel had conjured up. 
But this is also the situation that God had to start with in their lives individually. You know, it doesn't seem like a fair exchange on heaven's part. He, he takes my filthiness and he gives me blessing. He takes my sins and he gives me righteousness. He takes my failures and he gives me successes. He takes my being down and lifts me up. He takes my heartaches and gives me joy that flows like a river, peace without ending and peace without pain. Doesn't seem fair. Doesn't seem fair that we can go so far in the wrong direction and God says, my arm isn't so short that I can't reach you wherever you may go. David said, where will I go from your presence? Oh, I feel him this morning. Now he takes Ezekiel and he shows him these bones and he wants them to see them all when he says and he took him round about means he showed he went up and they seemingly saw all their doings and saw their depression and their just state of just being mortified by what's going on in their lives. He wanted him to see everyone in Israel and he wanted to hear them what they were saying and he wanted them to realize how badly they were affected by what they were speaking over and into their lives. There were dry bones everywhere. And I read this over and over this week. It says, and they were very dry, which meant they had been there a long time. Which means this, they had been speaking neg negativity probably an entire generation or more. They just could not elevate their sights and get their eyes off their problem and trust in God. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and the King of glory shall come in. Yea, lift up your heads, ye everlasting gates, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? He is the Lord strong and mighty. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and the King of glory shall come in. Hallelujah. <laughs> Did you know that the stem cell that creates blood is found in your bone marrow? Now stay with me now. Don't let me lose you here. This is this is critical to your understanding and pertinent for you to be able to put it together with where you are in a particular situation, either right now or what's coming to you in the future. Some of those bones, or those bones were dried up, which meant the marrow, the stem cell, the cell that produced life. Leviticus 17, 32, the life of the flesh is in the blood. If there's no stem cell for the production of blood, man cannot live without blood. So this is not only hopeless for now, but it was hopeless for their future. No reproductivity could take place because the stem cell that produces life now, we're talking about the most critical part of where life comes from. But we're not talking about bone marrow. And we're not talking about blood. And we're not talking about bones. We're talking about where we stand in our personal relationship and our intimacy with God. Amen, somebody. The bones cannot produce the very stem cell that brings blood. But God wants you to know just because there's something in your body, in your life, that's malfunctioning, that's going to arrive, that isn't functioning correctly, that's when God loves to step in. When you've looked from one end of the valley to the other, when every bone that you see is dry, 
when they're scattered in every direction until it's impossible to put each bone back together where it belongs. God wants you to see that when you have no power at all, when you can't do anything, that's when God loves to step in. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you love him this morning? When you have to just give up, that's when God steps in. When you don't have the answer, that's when God steps in. When the doctor says there's no medication I can give you to take away the pain, that's when Jehovah Jireh steps in. Uh, Jehovah Rapha begins to move. Uh, the son of righteousness arises with healing in his wings. Uh, when you have no hope, uh, that's when God uh, steps in to your life. Give him a clap offering of praise. That's when God's most powerful. God looked to Ezekiel and he said, Son of man, can these bones live? Now, God's omniscient, He knows everything, He knows what I'm going to say before I say it. Well, how do you know that? Because David said He did. David said, The Lord knows my thoughts are far off. You can get in trouble, can't you? God did not ask him, can these bones live for the sake of information? No, if Ezekiel was on the same page with him, on the same wavelength, because if Ezekiel wasn't on the same wavelength, God had picked out the wrong prophet. He was going to have to go find somebody. Now hear this. God is looking for somebody in word of life this morning to believe him for their miracle. I guess Ezekiel said the safest thing that could have been said. Lord, you know. Now in carnal language, that beats me. What are you asking me for? If God shows up in your life in a situation that is impossible and start asking questions that only the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent one can ask and know before he asks, you better get ready. Goosebumps on top of goosebumps is about to start flaring up all over your body because God is about to do the unthinkable in your life. If I was Ezekiel, I probably would have thought, well, you know, first thing I want to know is how much of God is going to be in these bones being raised from the dead. Now, God, if you want me to do it, uh, I, I, let, me tell you who you, I, let me tell you who's better at this than me. Not that I've seen them raise dry bones up and flesh grow on it and sinews come on their body and not that I know any of that, but I, I know a lot of people are better at You know, we always want to pass the buck on somebody else. When God is showing up and asking you some questions, it's not always a bad thing. He's about to reveal himself as God. Whew! Do y'all feel me tonight? Mm, I feel something messing with me. Praise God. How much of God is it going to take to raise a valley for a nation full of dry bones? I never will forget one time I went to South Carolina, Cal Penn, South Carolina, run a revival. And I was in the back of the church. Stepped out and went into the evangelist quarters. The pastor's son came in and says, you the preacher? I said, yeah. Preacher. He said, you going to run a survival? I said, yeah. He said, well, I hope you can. This church is dead. I thought, that don't sound good coming from a 10-year-old boy. So I hadn't, the pastor was gone. He was going to the hospital, and I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down and get me a snack. I'm hungry. And I went down to the service station, and lo and behold, the guy on the service station, he was a member of that church. He said, who are you? I told him. He said, yeah, I'll go there. He said, you run a survival this week? I said, yeah. He said, I hope you have, a, have an anointing on you because our church needs raising from the dead. I thought, oh, my God, maybe I need to just fill up and go back home. 
And then I get back to the evangelist quarters and the daughter, about seven year old, she said, preacher, we sure do hope that you can bring a revival. If you can't, my daddy is going to move. I said, well, I hope I can bring revival too, but it looks like it's just me and God. <laughs> and I had all kind of thoughts going through my mind. I began to, what in the world is this church going through or going through or what in the world is going on? And I tell you, Satan, he said, you, you just might as well go home. He said, you just go ahead and preach tonight. You're already here. You go ahead and preach and just tell the preacher you don't feel like you're the one for the revival. The devil told me that. I got so mad. I said, get thee behind me, Satan, you lying devil. And it wasn't a problem with the crowd. It was a decent crowd. I got up there and I preached, my God. I shouted all over the house. They just sat there and looked at me. And more than they looked, the more I said, I said, if you're a shot, I'm coming down your aisle next. <laughs> but you know God broke? You Sometimes it's just a matter of speaking hope back into a hopeless situation. Sometimes we don't realize it, but we've been around death so long, we have forgotten that our God reigns. That he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we're able to ask or think according to the power that works in us. <coughs> I've known God long enough to know that when he begins to ask specific questions about particular things, it's time to get excited because he's about to do something that we never dreamed possible. Forensic anthropologists can take a bone and they can tell you if there's enough history on that bone that they've got, they can tell you whose bone that was. They can look at the nasal ridge and they can tell you what ethnic group he, he is and they can also tell you what region of the world they came from. Just look at it in a bone. Isn't that something? No matter how much plastic surgery you do, your cheating bones will tell on you. Bones will tell you whether you're a male or a female. Your bone will tell you how tall a person was. Your bone will tell you how old you are. Your bones can even, I didn't know this, your bones can tell a person if they were left-handed or right-handed. Your bone can actually tell what your facial features were if they have the full skull. There is what is called an osteobiography. They can build a biography of your life from your bones man by the name, and he's the most renowned forensic anthropologist in the world. His name is Clyde Snow. He can take a bone and he can write your life's history. He can tell you where you lived. He can tell you what kind of life you lived. He can tell you what your main staple was all your life. He can tell you how old you were. He can literally write a book just looking at your bones. I didn't know that, did you? Now, why am I telling all that? When God showed Ezekiel this valley covered in dry bones, to him it was full of sad stories, pitiful, unfulfilled, and unfinished lives. Lives that did not live out to their fullest potential because Something horrible took place. Either somebody did something terrible or they did it to themselves not knowing what they were doing while they were doing it. The Bible already tells us what we can do to extend our life span on this earth. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mighty, and soul and your 
body and soul and your neighbor as yourself. Under thy mother and thy father and thy days shall be long upon the earth. We can do those two things and live longer than we would have had we not done those things. But these bones just weren't bones that Ezekiel was looking at. God was saying, here is a valley filled with biographies. Now what are you saying? Here's what I'm saying. He, these are people that matter to God. It doesn't matter how many people are driving up and down 145, whether they're lost or saved, they matter to God. People in your neighborhood, they may just absolutely drive you crazy with their lifestyle and their sinfulness and their immorality, but they still matter to God. Bones tell the story of people. And God looked down on that nation of Israel and he saw their pitiful state. And he wanted to get it into his prophet Ezekiel. I want you to see them. Yes, they've fallen, and yes, they've rejected me, and yes, they brought them on themselves, but I want you to know still, their lives matter to me. You matter to God. We matter to God's lives that stopped unfulfilled because something horrible. Life had ceased, scattered everywhere. Ezekiel was looking at the ultimate, the ultimateness of hopelessness. People's lives had come to an end before they got to fulfill God's greatest expectations of them. God asked, can these bones live? Again, Ezekiel said, Lord, thou knowest. And then God suggests something that blows my mind. He suggests these bones can't live under normal conditions. What I'm saying is if they're going to live and be fulfilled with their life and in their life, they're going to have to change. There's going to have to be a revival. They're going to have to do what the prophet Jeremiah said. They're going to have to go back to the old landmarks and break up the fallow ground and sow righteous seeds of living holy and pure before the Lord. Now the fact of the matter is, this was a sight, a valley of hopelessness, but to God it wasn't even a challenge. To God it was finding one man who would believe him and simply yield his life to him and allow him to work through him so that miracles of revivals and restorations could take place in the nation of Israel. Now let me say this in closing. Before Israel ever had a state of hopelessness, hopelessness in their life, God had already prophesied 800 years earlier that Cyrus was his shepherd and that God was going to use King Cyrus to bring his children back to him. Now, what am I telling you to end all of this? God was saying to the nation of Israel, I had the solution before you faced your problem. I had the answer before you stepped into dilemma. Before you started saying we're hopeless, we're a valley full of dry bones, we're alive but yet we're dead, we have no future, the end is near. Before all that happened, I'd already given you a remedy. Stand with me, please. Before you and I ever face the attack of the devil, before we face sickness, before we face anything that s Satan is going to use to try to take us out, God has already created a solution to bring about our breakthrough, our turnaround, our healing, our answer, our bringing out of captivity into deliverance. No matter what you face, Jesus is right for whatever is wrong in your life. If you're struggling with your partner, God is right. If you're struggling with your finances, God is right. If you're struggling with your healing, God is right. If you're struggling with your career, God is right. 
if you're struggling with knowing what to, to do with your life, God is right. You see, we need to re-enter the arena of faith and just trust God and let God be God in our lives. When you live a God-driven and a God-led life, he will take nothing and produce something out of it. God said, can these bones live? And when it was all over, when it was all over, the Bible said, and there arose an exceeding and mighty army. Bow your heads, please. Father, I thank you for the word of God, the incorruptible seed, the anointing, the presence of the Holy Spirit. I thank you that you're here this morning and that you're moving in this house. I thank you for those of us who've been encouraged because of the word and because of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. From the very beginning of the songs, the anointing was here. Thank you for showing up and blessing us. Thank you, dear God, for being what you need to be in our lives when we sometimes are so futile and helpless. Now, dear God, I speak to every heart. That you, I pray that you'll speak to every heart and that you'll touch every life that is struggling today. They need help. They need a breakthrough. They need a turnaround. They need to feel the sense of value and purpose in their life. I pray for them right now in Jesus' name. That you'll draw them to your bosom and you'll love on them and they'll walk out of this room today, dear Lord, feeling your loving presence and your ever-abiding comfort as they go out of this place back into the world and face the unknown. I pray your holy anointing will be upon those who are streaming in today. They feel hopeless and futile and lost and without direction and they're meandering through life, aimlessly wandering. I pray for them right now, Holy Spirit, that you'll speak to their heart and say, I am with you. This message is for you. It may seem hopeless. It may seem like the only answer is abandonment. But do not be afraid. I am the Lord thy God. I am with you, whithersoever thou goest. Wherever the soles of your feet shall tread, I will be with you, saith the Lord of hosts. And I speak that over both in the internet and in this congregation today, God, that you'll speak your peace, great peace in the lives of your people. Every head still bowed, every eye closed. Is anybody here now? Let's say, Pastor, I just 